Radar, or radio detection and ranging, played a crucial role in World War II, providing early warning of enemy aircraft and improving navigation for air and sea. Since the end of the war, radar technology transitioned from primarily military applications to various civilian uses, including air traffic control, marine navigation, meteorology, law enforcement, and astronomy. Today, radar technology is still used by astronomers and advanced by engineers to further the discovery of our universe. The next generation radar team, including members of the U.S. National Science Foundation's National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NSF's Green Bank Observatory, and Raytheon Technologies, is working to develop a high-powered radar transmitter for the Green Bank Telescope opening new avenues for research in planetary science and space situational awareness. How do radio astronomers capture cosmic data using radar? What kinds of information can data tell scientists? And how is the NG radar system different than other radar technologies? Stay tuned to find out on this episode of Beyond the Breakthrough, where we break down the latest developments in science and technology with help from the experts behind them. I'm your host, Kelsey Underwood. Before we begin, please note, the Green Bank Observatory and the National Radio Astronomy Observatory are facilities of the U.S. National Science Foundation, operated under cooperative agreement with Associated Universities Incorporated. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of the NSF and the implementation of any radar system on these facilities would be subject to NSF review and approval. Now let's meet our radar expert. With radio astronomy, uh, you have no control of what's coming to you. But in radar, we actually control that. We know exactly what we send out into space. So when we get that echo back, if it's any different than what we send out into space, that's telling us something about the object it bounced off of. And that's what makes radar really powerful for science. That's Patrick Taylor, the radar division head and director of the Next Generation Radar Project, or NG Radar. Patrick has been working on the NG Radar Project at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, or NREO, for the past two and a half years. Prior to his time at the NREO, Patrick worked at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico for nearly a decade working his way up from postdoctoral researcher to head of planetary radar. He's contributed to over 70 research articles, mainly on radar observations of asteroids, comets, planets, and moons in our solar system. He also published the first observational evidence that asteroids can be spun up like a pinwheel by sunlight, known as the Yorp effect, and even has an asteroid named after him, 9286 Patrick Taylor. The Green Bank Telescope which holds the title of the largest steerable radio telescope in the world, has been a radar receiver for over 20 years and will become a transmitter during the NG Radar project. The telescope is located at the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. While radio telescopes like the Green Bank Telescope or the GBT and radar systems both involve capturing radio waves, the processes are a bit different. Usually with radio astronomy, you are collecting light or radio waves, in this case, from objects that are emitting those radio waves to you from very far away, very long ago, sending these signals back to to Earth that we detect. Radar is different in the sense that uh, we make our own signal. So we transmit a signal from Earth and bounce it off of the target we want to look at, which is sometimes the moon, sometimes it's asteroids, pretty much anything that's solid and close to us in the solar system, uh, we can send out our own signal, bounce it off these solid objects, and then receive the signal with our telescopes on Earth again. And this can be really powerful because uh, with radio astronomy, uh, you have no control of what's coming to you. But in radar, we actually control that. We know exactly what we send out into space. So when we get that echo back, if it's any different than what we send out into space, that's telling us something about the object it bounced off of. When Patrick refers to the echo, he's not referring to an audible sound, but a rebounded radio light wave. It's the same idea as 
you go to the Grand Canyon, you stand on the edge and you yell into it and try and hear yourself say hello a bunch of times. You know, that's exactly what uh, we're doing. Uh, we're sending out an echo just like you're yelling hello into a canyon. And there's radio waves that signal bounces off the object and then comes back to you just like your voice, the sound waves bouncing off the canyon and coming back to you. It's the same idea, but we're using light instead of sound. And if the echo or the wave frequency is altered when it returns to Earth, astronomers can use the data to determine certain details about the space object, such as distance and direction. And this kind of goes back to our analogy of yelling hello into a canyon. Uh, you do that, you yell hello, and then you wait to hear your voice echo back. The time it's taking that echo to come back to you is telling you something about how far away that canyon is or how deep the canyon is. So how do astronomers know where to direct the radio waves? Patrick says optical telescopes often play a key role. And the truth is, uh, I don't really discover new asteroids or things by pointing the radar out because I've got this very narrow beam. We instead rely on these optical telescopes that have a big wide field of view and they can see a mm -hmm. lot of stars. They can see they can look for things moving through their field of view. That's how they can discover things. Then they tell us, the radar folks, hey, there might be something interesting at this specific position. And then we'll use the radar to follow up on that. So a lot of times we say radar isn't necessarily for discovery in astronomical terms. It's more of a follow up technique that we can use to, once we know about a target, we can use the radar to characterize it better. To illustrate the field of view for optical and radar, Patrick makes a comparison using objects that most of us interact with every day. An optical telescope, what it sees is kind of like the monitor of your laptop or the monitor of your desktop computer. It's covering many squared degrees. If you use the same uh, comparison of an optical telescope can see something like your laptop's monitor. What I can see with the radar is probably the size of maybe a couple letters of text on your laptop. So we sometimes call that a pencil beam because it's, it's a very narrow beam from your eyes, just the comparison of your eyes to your laptop screen. In addition to how much can be seen, optical telescopes and radar differ in what they can see as well. So radar can see things that optical things can't. And that essentially comes down to the wavelength of the signal. So optical, optical has really tiny, tiny wavelengths. And radar has a much longer wavelength to it. So when you when you shine radar or a signal onto, onto a target, it actually can penetrate into the surface. So for optical, that doesn't matter. That's that's that might as well be the surface. You're not seeing very deep. But radar, since it has a, a longer wavelength, it can see deeper into a surface. You could have some layer of something that's covered in a thin layer of dust, and optical mm -hmm. just sees the the dust on top. But radar can penetrate through that and see that there's something buried, and that's been used, especially on the moon, to try and find geological features that. Optical things can't, optical images don't see, but radar images can pick out that there's uh, like volcanic features that have been covered in dust over millions and millions of years. With the ability to capture such detailed data, radar serves as an excellent economical substitution for spacecraft missions. For the price of a spacecraft, we can essentially do flyby missions with radar for dozens or even hundreds of of objects and that's a way that we can start understanding the population as a whole of asteroids and small bodies of uh, it, it don't get me wrong it, it's great to send a spacecraft and learn everything you can about a, a specific a specific object mm -hmm. but it's all there's also benefit to being able to look at the population as a whole and be able to make inferences and of about objects you might not have a chance to send a spacecraft to. Not only is radar an extremely powerful tool in the field of planetary science, but it's also a highly effective device 
for planetary defense due to its high precision in determining how space objects, such as asteroids, are moving. If you can figure that out for an asteroid, then you can determine what its orbit is around the sun. And if you can do that with uh, very accurately, that means you can start to predict where it's going to be in the future. And if you can do that accurately, you will have a better idea what its chance is of potentially hitting Earth. And that's something we're concerned with. We we don't want it, want it to happen, but it's happened before. It will definitely happen again. But we now have the means to try and predict when those sorts of disasters might happen. And just how precise are we talking? We can measure how fast an asteroid is moving to often centimeters per second or even millimeters per second. And so this is really good for... Uh, Observing an asteroid and being able to reduce the uncertainty of its orbit. And the Green Bank Telescope's prototype radar system doesn't stop impressing there. Tested back in 2020 with the NRAO's 10 very long baseline array antennas as the receivers, this pilot transmitter may have had half the wattage of a standard kitchen microwave, but it produced the highest resolution images of the moon ever taken from Earth. Looking at the moon, we were able to make radar images of the moon that had a resolution of uh, 1.25 meters per pixel. So the moon is about 385,000 kilometers away. And this little 700 watt transmitter was able to make images with meter scale resolution. And just for reference, uh, there's a spacecraft orbiting the moon called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. It has optical cameras on it, and they take images of the moon um, at sort of one meter scale or, or half a meter per pixel. And we're approaching that with a radar telescope on the Earth while they are doing it from orbit around the moon. So this ended up producing some of the, well, the highest resolution images of the moon ever taken from Earth. And in addition to the moon, we were able to look at an asteroid as it flew by Earth. We were able to d detect this asteroid even though it was five times further away than the moon. With the prototype yielding incredible results already, imagine the outcomes of a transmitter with a thousand times the power and a receiver with almost triple the antennas. This is the goal for Patrick and the NG Radar team, who plan to use the NRAO's very large array as the receiver. To achieve this goal, the team will need to make quite a few upgrades to the Green Bank Telescope. To make it a permanent part of the telescope, we'll have to make some structural changes uh, to the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, we'll also have to improve the, the power that you can get to the telescope. So to get a thousand times more power out of the telescope, we need to put a thousand times more power into the telescope. So we'll have to, to add some uh, hardware and infrastructure for that. Um, we'll have to add the, the cooling system so we can waste the, the, the extra excess heat from the transmitter. So it's, it's going to be a large infrastructure project for Green Bank. When it comes to upgrading this massive piece of technology, what kinds of challenges arise? Patrick's two main challenges are often common for projects of this size. With any large project, I think the main challenges are having the funding and, and having the personnel. Um, we've, we've been lucky so far. We have, we've had support from the National Science Foundation for the the concept design for the NG radar system. Uh, we're pretty confident on being able to get uh, funding for the next stage of the design. Uh, but there's always the question of where do you where do you get the funding to actually do the construction? Um, where do you get the funding to operate it once you <laughs> once you've built it? And of course, personnel. You know, you need to be able to build a good team and be able to keep that team. Uh, we've already had experienced retirements and you know, trying to find how to backfill positions with people who have the knowledge to 
um, participate in the project is is always a challenge. These are decade long, sometimes multi decade long projects. So yeah, you need to be able to to keep your team together and be able to as seamlessly as possible, uh, you know, fill in uh, the gaps when they occur. It takes many different skilled staff to keep the Green Bank Telescope operating smoothly each day and just as diverse of a team to bring NG Radar to fruition for academic scientists, research scientists, and planetary defense agencies. Patrick advises those interested in pursuing a career similar to his to take opportunities that expose them to various types of astronomy which will support effective team collaboration and communication when working in their future specialty. In my position now, like we just mentioned, you have such a diverse group that you're working with. It's great to have that that specialization, but it's also great to have experience uh, when you can get it with a, a diverse group that do a bunch of different things. I think it was really helpful working so long at Arecibo Observatory, being there at an observatory or at a telescope where you're being exposed to scientists who have to work with the electrical engineers and the mechanical engineers and the operations folks, the facilities folks, the maintenance crews, uh, the contracts people, the budget and finance people, uh, funding agencies. I think that was really helpful to be exposed to all that. I know not everybody has the chance to work at an observatory. So I think maybe if if you have a chance to work on a spacecraft mission, if that works with the type of uh, science you're interested in or engineering you're interested in, I would imagine working with a a spacecraft mission would be really helpful because in the same sense as an observatory, you have a lot of different engineers, software people, management, budget, contracts, everything working together. So I think if you have a chance to work at an observatory, if you have a chance to work on a mission, I think those would be really good things to kind of broaden yourself and get you exposed to all the different uh, expertises you'll have to deal with in a large project. That wraps up our episode for today. It was such a pleasure sitting down with Patrick to learn about the Next Generation Radar Project at the National Science Foundation's Green Bank Observatory. If you would like to follow the progress of the project or learn more about the observatory, visit public.nreo.edu forward slash next hyphen generation hyphen radar. Or follow the Green Bank Observatory on Instagram, Facebook, or X. And be sure to join us next month for a part two episode. The Green Bank Observatory's Will Armentrout will be returning to the podcast to discuss radar through the lens of planetary defense. If you would like to be notified about new Beyond the Breakthrough episodes and bonus content, be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening and consider leaving us a review while you're there to let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. Also, you can follow AUI on Instagram at Discover AUI and Associated Universities, Inc. on Facebook and LinkedIn to stay updated on all the latest breakthroughs at AUI. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.